Hello, my name is Ben Coons, and this is our talk on extraarticular, uh, in quotes, hip pathology, uh, focusing on the periarticular muscles uh, that surround the hip joint. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge Tyler McCarroll, who's one of my co-fellows who helped develop these slides. Disclosures are on the AOS Academy website. So one of the uh, major focus for uh, periarticular uh, hip muscle injuries uh, is this broad diagnosis called greater trochanteric pain syndrome. Uh, it is something that's uh, all encompassing, which uh, is can be a challenge to define, uh, but uh, uh, sort of all encompassing for lateral hip pain or any pain on the uh, lateral aspect of the hip or greater trochanter. Uh, broadly, it can be defined into uh, greater trochanteric bursitis, which uh, in isolated form is uh, fairly rare. Uh, you can have gluteal tendinopathy, uh, which is uh, tendinosis of the gluteus minimus or, or primarily the gluteus medius tendon. Uh, and then there's going to be different stages of tearing of the abductor musculature uh, from partial low-grade tears where the medius uh, still has a, a fairly strong attachment uh, to the greater troke uh, to higher grade full thickness and then uh, full thickness tears with retraction. So uh, an analogy uh, sort of based on evolutionary biology uh, for uh, uh, abductor, uh, uh, hip abductor tendon tears, or you can sort of think of them as the rotator cuff of the hip, where they are periarticular muscles that uh, attach around a joint to help stabilize that joint. Focusing on the anatomy, uh, uh, looking at the greater trochanter, there's three bursa. So there's the trochanteric bursa, which uh, most everyone is familiar with. There's the uh, uh, subgluteus medius and subgluteus minimus bursa, which uh, uh, can also uh, be inflamed. Uh, as far as uh, uh, tendon insertions, there is a the medius insertion, which has a broad insertion over the greater trochanter, and the minimus insertion, which is more anterior. Uh, there are four palpable facets of the greater troch. Uh, so there's the anterior facet, uh, superior posterior facet, lateral facet, and posterior facet. The gluteus medius attachment uh, uh, encompasses and sort of spreads out over the um, posterior three facets there. Looking at the clinical presentation for uh, lateral hip pain, uh, usually there's not a uh, sudden injury. It's not acute. Uh, uh, patients don't hear a pop. Uh, sometimes they can have hip pain if they land directly on their side. Uh, but uh, as far as uh, uh, tendon uh, tears are concerned, uh, the um, uh, it's rarely... Um, it is, I'm sorry, it is rarely acute. Um, the uh, age, it's usually in an older population, over 50, uh, females uh, greater than males. Uh, and uh, if they have clinical signs of weakness, uh, where they are unable to abduct their leg, particularly in the uh, 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 lying on their side, uh, as well as a limp uh, or the Trendelenburg sign when you examine them. That's going to be more concerning for a, a higher grade uh, abductor tear than someone with just uh, pain on the outside of their hip alone. So looking at the uh, sort of broad differential we were talking about uh, for greater drug enteric pain syndrome, uh, there's uh, gluteal tears, which we'll uh, spend a majority of the talk on, but there's also isolated bursitis, and you can have snapping of the IT band laterally uh, over the greater trochanter. And when you think of the you know, four-layer approach to the hip, starting you know with uh, um, the osseous structures, then going with the ligamentous and capsular structures and the dynamic muscular structures, and then you also have uh, the you know, nervous and uh, the structures uh, more superficial. So you can have nerve injury, you can have spine injury. Uh, and the key thing to consider is also uh, uh, intraarticular pathology that has uh, uh, essentially predisposed a person to develop uh, tendinopathy or over, um, you know, abductor overuse uh, uh, type injuries 
from a problem inside the joint as well. So a lot of times people can have lateral hip pain that manifests as abductor weakness, uh, but uh, you know that might have been started by a problem inside the hip joint. So it's always important to evaluate for any intraarticular pathology, diagnose it, and treat it as you are able. So. Uh, looking at the diagnosis, uh, isolated uh, greater trochan bursitis, as we said, is rare, uh, and uh, look for uh, other underlying pathologies, such as intraarticular um, pathology there. Um, looking at uh, uh, imaging person comes in with lateral hip pain, uh, we always usually start with x-rays. Uh, and here you can uh, see some calcification. Sometimes you can see some enthesopathy of the abductor tendon. Uh, important not to confuse this with heterotopic ossification. So uh, evaluate if a patient has uh, you know, had a surgery or not, and if it looks more like heterotopic ossification versus uh, calcific tendonitis. Uh, you can use ultrasound as a diagnostic tool, so you can uh, actually uh, identify abductor tears uh, dynamically uh, by uh, by moving the leg. You can you can see uh, uh, how uh, a attached abductor tendon versus detached abductor tendon, abductor tendon move differently under ultrasound. Uh, there's uh, also uh, the next steps once there is a clinical concern uh, is uh, to get an MRI, uh, which is for non-invasive studies is uh, uh, probably the most accurate at uh, identifying uh, abduction pathology. So there are different ways to grade tear types. Uh, you can uh, look at chronic tendinosis within the tendon itself, and then you can look at the tendon and attachment uh, uh, onto the greater trochanter. Here, uh, you can try and uh, differentiate between partial thickness and full thickness. Um, a lot of times, the uh, coronals and the axials are the best cuts to be able to do that. So uh, focusing on treatment, once you've diagnosed a uh, abductor injury, uh, the uh, I always start with non-operative treatment, uh, and this is going to be for someone that doesn't have a full thickness tear, uh, you know, with clinical weakness, where uh, the um, primary surgical route is probably the best for that. Um, but looking at non-operative measures, uh, we focus on physical therapy to start, uh, NSAIDs, and uh, there are different other uh, modalities with ultrasound and things like that to to help out. Uh, but this is the first line management. Uh, there's a lot of supporting data to show that patients do get better from this. So uh, if they can get better without a surgery, that's always uh, um, the, the first way to go. And uh, in addition to physical therapy and anti-inflammatories, if they have persistent pain um, before uh, surgical intervention, uh, important to consider injections. Classically, these have been done with cortisone. However, there are, are significant drawbacks to cortisone, uh, particularly from uh, an infection and uh, the uh, catabolic standpoint where repeated cortisone injections can actually weaken uh, the tendon and cause further atrophy. Uh, but uh, cortisone injections are an option. Uh, additionally, uh, platelet-rich plasma uh, injections are another option uh, that have shown success. Uh, the differences between uh, the two, uh, the, the downsides of biologics are uh, primarily the cost, uh, which is oftentimes uh, dependent on the patient. Uh, so it's just a discussion that, that needs to be had. Uh, but uh, the cortisone injections are cheaper. Uh, so that is just, you know, something that's going to uh, need to talk with the patient. But if you're trying to get a measure of healing rather than uh, just a, a Band-Aid, uh, you consider biologic injection. And uh, we actually wrote a systematic review uh, uh, showing this and also comparing things to surgery. And uh, 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 the conclusion from five different studies uh, showed that both PRP and surgery uh, improve uh, patient outcomes. So that's something to consider. Now focusing on surgery, uh, which uh, uh, surgeons we all like, uh, we want to uh, start uh, essentially going from uh, the, the smallest to the biggest. So we're going to start with partial thickness abductor tears and then uh, extend all the way to um, whole thickness retracted tears. So uh, classically, these uh, any abductor uh, pathology uh, that was treated with surgery was treated through an open incision uh, through the lateral aspect of the hip. Uh, the IT band was incised uh, so that you could uh, uh, look with your eyeballs 
at the uh, uh, abductor tendons and, and visualize the tear. A lot of times it's hard uh, uh, with this approach to uh, truly diagnose a partial thickness tear because the tendon uh, superficially can look so that, like it's still attached, um, but if it's attached, if it has an undersurface tear, uh, that's something that needs to be probed and, and uh, 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 further evaluated. So something to consider with the open approach. If you see that the tendon looks like it's attached, you need to make sure that there isn't an undersurface tear that uh, can uh, still be causing the patient pain. Uh, just from the anatomy, uh, uh, you can see the uh, where the trochanter, the tendon is, is normally supposed to be inserted, uh, and then you can see the tendon itself has uh, torn off that trochanter, so it's torn off from its insertion point. And the goal of surgery, whether open or endoscopic, is to uh, uh, take a viable tendon and repair it down in a uh, tension-free or as tension-free as possible uh, construct back to its anatomic insertion. So. Uh, looking at different uh, repair types uh, uh, for, for the classic studies with open uh, uh, repair, they have shown good outcomes. Uh, and uh, the complication rate with the, uh, the open studies, their retear rate was just under 10%. And uh, there's also hematoma um, recorded complications. Other things to consider are infections with a bigger incision and the patient population uh, that usually has these uh, types of injuries uh, are also you're, you're prone to soft tissue complications. So something to consider if you choose the open route. Uh, so uh, uh, another way to treat uh, more uh, partial thickness or non-retracted full thickness tears can be endoscopic. Uh, so this is using a 70 degree uh, arthroscope, not inside the joint, but actually uh, uh, going out and looking uh, in that uh, um, in that uh, trochanteric region, uh, you can identify uh, the tear similarly to how you do open. Uh, but here you can actually get a better appreciation for those partial thickness uh, undersurface tears uh, just from the nature of the arthroscopy. Uh, and uh, there, there are various ways that have been recorded uh, in the literature uh, to repair these, but the uh, 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 a double row repair where you have uh, uh, an extra layer of reinforcement is something that uh, can be beneficial. So uh, for a technique uh, that is uh, uh, performed at the American Hip Institute, uh, this is an endoscopic repair. Uh, you can see uh, the, um, the tendon is on the uh, uh, sort of upper half of the screen. And this is a uh, um, uh, either a partial thickness undersurface or a, a non-retracted tear. So the tendon uh, itself still has, um, is, is centered in its anatomic uh, uh, or, or insertion where it should be. Uh, but there are uh, uh, going to be drill holes placed uh, where the, uh, uh, and then uh, suture anchors uh, that are knotless. And uh, at the end of the, of the procedure, uh, just by passing the sutures sort of B to A and A to B, you're going to get a, uh, a double row. So it's reinforced both proximally and distally a suture bridge technique. So we uh, uh, were one of the first groups to publish our outcomes on uh, abductor repairs. Uh, we uh, looked at 32 patients uh, treated with endoscopic repair, broad age range from 20 to 79. Um, and uh, majority uh, partial thickness tears, but some full thickness without retraction. Uh, these patients overall did quite well. Uh, and the results were durable uh, uh, two years out from surgery. So uh, you can see with their pain scores on the top graph, uh, preoperatively and the pain between, um, you know, around a seven, two years out, uh, they still had some pain, but it was about a three. So this is a kind of surgery that, uh, you know, it's hard to make someone perfect, but uh, you, you can uh, make patients better. And uh, a, little, a lot of them are very grateful because they're coming in, you know, walking with canes and a limp. And if you can fix that for them, uh, they're, they're going to be some of your, your favorite patients. Looking at some of the data for endoscopic repair. Now, uh, um, you know, there have been multiple studies evaluating this. Uh, lower rates of uh, some complications, uh, the, the soft tissue complications with infections and hematomas and things like that. 
Um, we all, there's also lower retail rates uh, in the endoscopic literature. However, the uh, uh, pairs that are being treated uh, endoscopically are typically lower grade, so hard to tell. Um, and, you know, a lot of times you're not going to try and take a full thick, uh, treat a full thickness retracted abductor tendon uh, endoscopically. And uh, looking at uh, outcomes further out, so rather than two years, looking at five years, uh, uh, this is a study on 14 patients uh, that uh, also showed durable results. Uh, there was uh, no significant deterioration between two and five years, and there were no uh, uh, failures of the abductor repair. Uh, there were uh, um, one patient did need to go on to total hip arthroplasty for arthritis, uh, but there wasn't a problem with the abductor repair itself. So for partial thickness and full thickness with no retraction, endoscopic repair is a really good option uh, if uh, you're, you're equipped to do so. The uh, uh, sort of escalating up in in damage is a full thickness tear with retraction or fatty muscle degeneration. Uh, one of the things that you can see on MRI. And uh, these patients are often treated open. Uh, if they're a retracted tendon, it is hard to get uh, to visualize and, and repair endoscopically. Uh, so this is with that open approach. Um, and uh, similarly, patients do do well. So so these outcomes were comparable to the endoscopic results we just discussed. And uh, similarly, uh, you can have uh, uh, durable res uh, uh, results when you uh, compare uh, patients that have had uh, endoscopic and um, open treatment. If you do have uh, fatty degeneration at the time of surgery, it is a negative prognostic indicator uh, for success. So it's something to inform patients about. So uh, for a full thickness retracted tear, we talked about open surgical repair. And then for a massive or irreparable uh, tendon, so this is something that uh, where the decision is made intraoperatively that uh, the uh, trying to repair the tendon anatomically uh, will uh, have too much tension on that repair. Uh, there is the uh, in one option uh, for uh, having a uh, reconstruction graft. So this is uh, uh, it can be a dermal allograft or, or any kind of allograft to help bridge the gap between the retracted tendon uh, and its anatomic insertion. So um, again, more of a salvage type procedure because it is not native tendon, but it is definitely a, a good option um, when there when you know there aren't a whole lot of good options. The last uh, technique would be a gluteus maximus uh, transfer, and uh, this is uh, for an irreparable uh, gluteus medius, where you're uh, the you've made the decision that the the remaining uh, gluteus medius muscle is probably going to be non-functional, either by the severity of the retraction or the degree of atrophy uh, that you can see both intraoperatively and on the MRI. Uh, so the goal of uh, the gluteus maximus transfer would be to uh, use a slip of the gluteus maximus, which is typically a hip extensor, uh, transferring it uh, into the uh, 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 more anteriorly. So it can be a hip abductor uh, and uh, take over uh, some of the job of the now um, fairly uh, functionless uh, gluteus medius. So these are just uh, uh, some intraoperative photos showing the transfer going uh, um, uh, uh, as it's released from insertion on the posterior femur and then transferred over uh, to the uh, greater trochanter. That's sort of the completed result there uh, showing the um, different position of the gluteus maximus tendon. Uh, and uh, this is something that patients do benefit from. If you uh, look at the outcome scores in this uh, table two here, uh, the outcomes are not as good as uh, you know primary abductor repair, which makes sense. But uh, um, you are able to restore some function in these patients, uh, and, and oftentimes they are very grateful. So um, that's pretty much the full palette of options. Uh, uh, regarding surgery from partial thickness uh, tear, uh, abductor tears where you treat them endoscopically to uh, massive uh, tears that you can treat either with a, uh, a, uh, a cellular dermal allograft or that gluteus maximus transfer. So uh, other causes of greater trochanteric uh, pain syndrome, 
uh, you can get isolated uh, uh, bursitis. Uh, you know, again, primary treatment for this is initial non initially non-operative, um, but there is surgical treatment where you can endoscopically or open uh, perform a trochanteric bursectomy. Key thing is ensuring that uh, there's been a, a, a thorough workup to make sure that there's no other source of pathology, uh, either intraarticularly or extraarticularly. Uh, uh, other options, in addition to a bursectomy, you can do an iliotibial band release. Uh, this is particularly useful in the uh, in the setting of external snapping, where that IT band is snapping um, over the greater trochanter. A lot of times, you can ask patients in clinic to cause the hip to snap, and that's uh, uh, you know that's a really good uh, uh, AY to diagnosis. But be intraoperatively, you can see what position the uh, the uh, femur is when the IT band snaps over it. So it's something that you can perform your IT band release uh, to make sure that it's no longer snapping when you put the femur in that position. And if there is uh, 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 too much uh, tightness on the gluteal sling, that can be released. It's also a cause for uh, 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 some pain and um can be related to some ID pen tightness as well. So uh, a lot of different uh, uh, proposed treatment options. So uh, looking at the pros and cons versus endoscopic or open gluteus medius repairs, uh, it's really gonna be dependent on the type of tear. Uh, you wouldn't want to treat a full thickness, you know, retracted tear endoscopically, uh, and you wouldn't necessarily want to treat a partial thickness under surface tear open. Uh, so you want to tailor the treatment uh, for the correct diagnosis. And uh, this is a uh, just results uh, showing uh, patients uh, from a different population that are more active. They do uh, return to uh, they have high rates of uh, you know returning to their activities that they weren't able to perform due to um, their pathology. So in general, uh, abductor tears are a common cause of lateral hip pain. We focus first on non-operative management, but if that fails, uh, there are numerous surgical treatments that uh, have shown to be uh, not only successful, but also durable at five years um, post-operatively. So switching gears now uh, for something completely different, we're going to uh, move uh, posteriorly to the proximal hamstring. So the proximal hamstring, uh, uh, its origin is on the ischial, tuber the ischial tuberosity, and it has a unique anatomy where there's the semimembranosus, semitendinosus, and uh, uh, two heads of the biceps femoris. And the uh, conjoint uh, uh, tendon uh, will actually cross over the uh, semimembranosus of joint tendon being the uh, 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 the combination of the uh, semitendinosus and the long head of the biceps femoris. It will rotate and insert uh, more medially with the semimembranosus, uh, inserting a little more laterally. And that's what uh, is shown uh, um, here in this graphic depiction of their insertions. But uh, trying to recreate this uh, rotation uh, is one of the goals of anatomic repair. So uh, uh, proximal hamstring, uh, it's uh, classically a water skiing type injury, but a lot of times we see it in track athletes or um, uh, uh, football players, basketball players, uh, where you put yourself in a position where you have an eccentric load with a flexed hip and extended knee. So think any position that tightens the hamstrings, if you flex your hip and extend your knee, uh, and then apply a load that um, could potentially put the, the hamstring at risk. So uh, as opposed to the greater trochanteric pain syndrome patients, these patients, uh, it's usually acute. So they have a sudden pain. They can hear a pop. A lot of times there is ecchymosis down the posterior thigh. Sometimes they can feel a mass of, uh, you know, where that proximal hamstring has retracted. Uh, and there's going to be associated weakness and a limp. So x-rays are often negative uh, if uh, it's a younger patient who hasn't reached skeletal maturity uh, um, or in, in, in some rarer cases in adults, uh, you can get avulsions uh, off the ischial tuberosity, and that's something an x-ray will pick up. An MRI 
um, is the next step when there is a high clinical concern, which you can uh, diagnose by tenderness over the ischial tuberosity, hamstring weakness, uh, you know, looking for ecchymosis. All of those are signs for a, a possible hamstring injury for which an MRI is indicated. And uh, uh, look, as far as the treatment goes, if there's a torn retracted tear, that treatment is surgical. However, if there's a partial thickness tear where the uh, it's still largely attached um, and you don't have retraction uh, of the uh, of the hamstring, uh, non-operative treatment uh, is a is a good consideration. And uh, for those patients that uh, you know have a partial thickness tear or full thickness non-retracted tear, um, they might have a more chronic presentation, uh, which is also something to think about as well. So for non-operative treatment, uh, you can focus on uh, PRP uh, uh, in addition to physical therapy, anti-inflammatory regimen, uh, all of those um, are, are good options. If those fail, an endoscopic uh, repair uh, is uh, can be considered as well. For uh, larger injuries, uh, so if there's a you know, retraction greater than two to three centimeters, an open repair uh, is indicated big, um, just uh, to improve the visualization uh, of the anatomy and the torn tendon. Uh, if there is an avulsion uh, where the bone is actually displaced, and for the avulsions, the tendon is still largely attached to that avulsed piece of bone, uh, then that's something that can uh, be fixed uh, with a uh, uh, with uh, a screw. Uh, so that's an open reduction internal fixation where you reduce uh, the avulsion fracture, uh, put the bone back to where it broke off, and fix it with a screw. Looking at mid-substance hamstring uh, strains, these are non-operative. So this is going down uh, the hamstring muscle belly away from the hip, uh, but uh, it's a, a, a very common site of injury in adults. Think weekend warrior type injury. Um, risk factors would be a previous hamstring injury uh, or a, a, a deficient hamstring to quad ratio, uh, uh, reduced hip extension. Uh, or a uh, uh, subtle leg length discrepancy. So as we said, the treatment for mid-substance tearing is non-operative. Uh, if there's a hematoma, uh, uh, then you can uh, 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 treat it with either therapy or PRP. If there is not a hematoma, so this slide is incorrect, uh, then uh, you uh, can uh, treat it with just therapy alone. Thank you so much for your time.